Hey, this is Daily Vlog, and this is a different type of video. This is not a <laughs> workout update, but this is a vlog about my experience with Quickstar, Amway, experiences a long time ago. And um, I, was, I was driving around, and I was wondering, whatever happened to those guys who were at the top of this uh, organization? And uh, where are they now, especially during this time of the economy and everything where you can't gather the way that you could. And, um, you know, just the um, the investment of time and resources that I put into that group a long time ago. And, and even other people, even other people who are uh, involved with it. And so I just want to talk about my experience with it uh i had a lot of emotion i was like wow i just kind of had a reflective moment so i thought this would be a good time to to talk about it so you rewind back to 2004 2003 2004 2005 um you know i was i was working at the first church i did sound for and i was you now it's the first time i ever made like a substantial amount of money um, as a sound engineer. I got I got into it pretty quickly, and I was approached by this guy, and that we were just talking, and I think he had a, one of those nice Pontiacs I wanted to have, and uh, he approached me about a business opportunity, <laughs> and uh, you know I said come check it out, and I was like yeah, he was like yeah, you know it's something we can do, you know make, you know, residual income, retire before you're 30, stuff like that. And I'm like, great, you know, now I, this might be the way I, I can check off a box to, you know, be like my dad. Uh, at the time, my dad was working for General Motors and to my, to my understanding, he was making good money doing that. And all I wanted to do was even at that time was like, okay, well, maybe this could be a straight shot to becoming this level of provider like him. Um, because as far as being a sound engineer was concerned, I was making good money, but I know it wasn't enough to raise a family with. I know it wasn't enough to uh, be that level or at least finance the type of vehicles that he was financing for the family because he was financing multiple vehicles for the family, which... Looking back at it now, it would have been smarter to just cash out on vehicles for the family, but that's in the past. So, you know, the language, hey, I got a business opportunity and, you know, come to this meeting. So obviously I came to the meeting, excited to hear about it. And I was like, wow, look at all these people. It was set up to be very presentable, which most meetings like that are. They're set up to be preventable, uh, presentable. You know, you get in for free and then... Long story short, you know, him and his upline talked to me about it. And, you know, there's this entry fee to get into it. But I had the money. Not really, but I kind of had the money. So I think it was almost like $200 something dollars to get in to this organization. And now, every and then now starts the, the brainwashing. Now starts the, the process of, and I liked it. And it was a sense of community. It was, and it was a different type of community there than I had a church when I worked for because while I was there working at the first church I was working against a lot of odds like and I'll talk about it the white engineers kind of showed me respect with my skill because of where I graduated from in full sale however the community that was in the church which the majority is black still um still didn't know me and still wouldn't really kind of treat me like the talented person that I was and it was an uphill battle and I, it just like it's I could just feel like because I didn't have the rock star ponytail and I didn't have the right skin color to be a sound engineer that they weren't going to take me seriously. So here I am now in a majority white community going to these meetings at these hotels and, you know, now you're wearing suits and that felt good. It felt good to be part of a community and now I'm being introduced to books. Uh, that I was never introduced to before. I was like, wow, I like that. Oh, this is made me better, stuff like that. And I got taught about Rich Dad, Poor Dad, 
rich dad, poor dad was woven into the sales pitch of why you should get into the business because Robert Kiyosaki talks about if you want to become, uh, you know, uh, substantially rich or more, uh, more affluent with your money, you had to get to the passive side of income. So this, so while rich dad, poor dad outline the difference between an active income and a passive income, the, the language for leaving it open was wide open for you to weave in this business opportunity in that because the way it was shown is that you're part of the structure and as you get people in your team, you start to benefit from their sales. So you got this person above you, that's your upline, and then the people below you is the downline. And so all these people who buy into the business, you receive a cut from. And so the person at the very top reaps the most value. And then even in the sales pitch, they talked about Ray Kroc. And I heard it so many times. They talked about Ray Kroc and, and, and how he franchised and leveraged his time versus money. So if you had, wow, and I just had a revelation about that. And the interesting thing is when you're, you know, you, you're, you're leveraging your time and money. So if you worked, so long story short, if you worked eight hours a day, you only made the money for eight hours a day. But if you had a business and you franchised two business under you. So you got your business working eight hours a day and the two businesses working under you at eight hours a day, you've made 24 hours of money in only eight hours a day. That was the power of franchising. So you had the structure and, and I, and I, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I, no one ever showed me that. My dad never taught me about that. My dad and family around me taught me, you know, go to school so you can find a good job. It wasn't about work for itself. Even at the same time, he was trying to do his own construction business. Um, and even at that situation, I, I wish that there was more explained. However, I didn't, you know, he, he didn't really explain it. Con- and then I, I'm like, I didn't like working because I didn't know when I was going to be paid, you know, with my dad, with the construction business and that. That caused issues with me. And I think probably my dad didn't know when he was getting paid. And um, it was just not a good look. But coming back to the business, you know, you're being exposed to these books. You're around all these people are sharp. Everybody's talking positive. And you know, you're like, and then you're doing these different meetings at different churches and you're being shown the business plan and people's people's groups are growing because they have people come up. And so now you have this pressure and this anxiety because you got people coming up with people getting into their downline as far as building their structures. And you're like still sitting in the seat, just kind of believing that you'll get it. You'll get it. All you need to do is listen to more tapes and more CDs, which to me, after I got out of it, I learned was the hustle. The hustle was not the business, the hustle was buying the materials to help you build your business. So you needed to buy this tape, you needed to buy that tape to educate yourself so that you can put yourself in position to grow your business. Now keep in mind, I never signed up for an LLC the whole time. So I don't know how legally I could call myself my own business when I've never signed an LLC. And on top of that, if you wanted to be at a certain level of membership, you had to generate a certain amount of points or sales. So now I'm paying out to being at meetings. I'm dealing with the anxiety of trying to pitch this and get people into my business. Nobody took me seriously at my early 20s. And it's a very hard sell as a young black man to sell to a white guy, older guy at an apartment store or mall. So now everywhere I, and then so the mindset was everywhere you went, you're now looking to see who you can talk to the close way. And you're trying to think of all the things you learned in the tapes that you're supposed to say and not say. And then all the cold content, like literally we would get together on Sunday afternoons and go down and create this list of cold contacts that we had to do to call to see if we can get them to come to a meeting and talk with them about the business. So it's this constant. And on top of this, I still wanted to do music. And oh yeah, I'm not having the most fun doing sound at this church situation, but it was the best situation I ever had as far as income. And I didn't know how to 
leverage that. And I didn't really have anybody in my life to really coach me to do that. I mean, I had parents that cared, but I had parents that never worked in the audio industry before. And that was the normal. And so I'm paying for tapes and CDs to learn more about how to build my business. I got the anxiety of wondering who do I close as a prospect, um, doing meetings at, and I can remember this one time, I was at Morehouse College with the other black entrepreneurs. And there's this woke guy coming to us talking about our products. We're like, we're just all natural. We're trying, and we're just trying to sell products. And the guy wanted to come in and be all woke and tell us what's wrong with our products. Our ex excess energy drinks, which I did enjoy, but sometimes I would drink so much of it that I would get a headache. But I did enjoy it. And I thought, I was like, wow, this is a really cool product. And I like it. And, uh, you know, constantly you're like, okay, well, I need to buy this certain amount of products to see if I got anything back. And I think I remember getting something back. But it was like a fraction. And it was just... It was just not my thing. And then I was still working at the church. And one of the biggest, hardest things to do was to actually take time off of the church. I didn't have much income. And because they would have these team national meetings in like North Carolina, Kentucky. And it was like, and, you know, during the whole times where you have meetings, they're hard selling the, the, the community leadership meetings and stuff like that. And it's like, man, you got to go. And it, oh, man, you missed out. And then, you know, what they do is they kind of spin it to where it's like, well, we're not going to tell you what happened at it. You got to make sure you go to the next one. So that added more pressure and anxiety to go. And those tickets cost. So now you're paying out a ticket. It's like a hundred something dollars to go to the, to the team meeting for the weekend. And so here I am taking time off of church, losing money from not working at the church, going with people I don't really know to somewhere, to some hotel somewhere to be at this meeting and they got you waiting outside and it's like and all this this pressure and this vibe all everybody trying to get in to get in on this thing because we all believe that this is special and this is the answer to take us out of the the rat race you get the language that i'm talking about all this pressure to get you out of the rat race so that you become financially free which is what we all want to be anyway we all want to be financially free um we want to flush that seeking job nobody likes their jobs that was the culture and I can remember waiting outside some places smell funny because a lot of these places will be like by farmland and or be really cold. And it's like, oh, that's that's part of the that's part of the struggle. That's part of the culture to get you where you want to be. And I can even remember eating at this Wav house one time and it was packed. And I think all the black people sat by like one table and. I was like, this doesn't feel right to me. And the interesting thing is, it's like, and, and you didn't have any sleep. So you're, you're in class or you're in the arenas all day being taught by these speakers all day long. And then you're talking to these speakers who are celebrities after the event. So you're trying to talk to them and get in their circle and hear that nugget. It was about getting nuggets at these hotels and at these events after the events. And you wanted to, you wanted to, you wanted to, you wanted to be part of that exclusivity because if you weren't a silver or a gold or a platinum you there are certain places you cannot get to and there are certain places you weren't allowed to sit so now you got this anxiety of well dang i didn't make the cut i want to get down there on the floor or i want to get there on that stage and it became all about that and you know as a young person and you know really didn't know how to talk about this with your parents and most families that families that you had didn't really take you seriously about opportunities. Like I said, I was the baby of the family, so nobody really took me seriously. I'm a young man at a church. Nobody at the church really took what I had going on seriously either. And, you know, and I can remember doing something really stupid because of the business. And. So I had an opportunity to go on a beatboxing tour in Florida with some friends of mine. So this is my first tour and we were doing different spots down in Florida to go beatbox and do shows. And that was during the week. And then I actually did a show on a Friday night or Saturday night. I remember the day. And the show went late to like one. And I thought I was going to have enough time to drive back from Florida all the way back to Atlanta to get back to the team community big hoo-ha meeting and so i was doing shows and touring in florida and i left the tour early 
at like one o'clock in the morning to drive back up to Georgia overnight. Now, consider I've been up all day just to hop into somebody else's car to go to the team meeting. And all of them were up and like, yeah, and I'm like trying to sleep because I needed some sleep. And that drive was probably the most dangerous, riskiest drive I ever did. And I mean, literally, I was seeing things on the road. But I felt so much pressure to perform under that culture. You know, I think that's when things started to crack for me for the business because I was really getting into risky behavior and and the culture of the business is like, well, these people are your parents. They're they're not you're it's almost like they teach you that you're better than them because they're not thinking the way that you do. And you know, cast them aside if they don't get it, kind of a thing. Or or, you know, that's them over there and you're here with us and we are special because we're going to be financially free because we're a part of this. And so while I did feel like I was a part of the community, I also felt excluded from some parts of it because a lot of people who were on top did not look like me. And again, it's a hard sell to sell a, a business opportunity to people in my demographic. One, we don't, we don't have any money. Uh, two, because of our reputation of not having money and not having our stuff financially together, it's hard to sell across cultural borders to bring them in to be a part of this business. And I can remember the Sunday of these team, these rallies. Yeah. Team leadership rallies, you know, in Kentucky. Um, they would have Sunday church. And I was like, oh, that's a check mark. We're at church. And it was, a, it was a time for them to kind of minister about this business. But then it kind of turned into a come to Jesus kind of moment where you know, they're offering you Christ into your life, which I thought was, was like, oh, that's that's heartwarming. That's cool. But here we are. We're exhausted. We did not get any sleep. We're at these arenas all day learning about these classes. We're up and we're staying up, up all night trying to get nuggets from people who are more successful in the situation. And at the same time, oh, you got to get your own products, too, because, hey, no one no one ever became your downline. And you, but, but you want, but you want to be like your pops because your pops is making a lot of good money. And you believe that you as a music producer at that time could do it. It's not quite working out yet. So you maybe this is it. And it looks very serious because everybody's there. There's like hundreds of people at the Serena all under this business opportunity. And then you're being shown books and then you're buying tapes and CDs. And, you know, it went from listening to music in the car to listening to these tapes and CDs about mentoring and coaching. But I never, ever, and I was in it for a while and I was putting a lot of money into it and not really getting any money back from the experience. And I can even remember after the team meetings during the week on Mondays, trying to hang out with everybody afterwards and I think I had the flexibility to do it because I was a full-time sound uh, sound engineer at the time and I can remember this guy uh, Campbell Hay and he showed up at this uh, we were at this kind of the sub place and this is like hey guys come hang with us after the meeting to really get some nuggets to, and I was like wow I'm, I'm, I'm you know and this is kind of what you did to be part of this community and I remember one time uh, he he brought in fifty thousand dollars in cash like literally, he brought in fifty thousand dollars in cash, and I think it was so like, yeah, if you do such and such, you get fifty thousand dollars in cash. And he had, and I held fifty thousand dollars in cash in my hand for a hot second. That break of money was heavy, and I'll never forget that experience because, I was like, wow, this is this is real. And uh, the truth of the matter is that it it wasn't real for me. And I'm wondering what happened to everybody else. Even my upline is no longer in the business, but he just buys products. So what does that look like? So you're just going to buy products and not be part. So you're telling me you're not retired from your nice paying job either. And my personal upline, I haven't heard from him since. And I think that's the one thing I think about with churches and just, just community groups in general. 
once you're out of that community and group, nobody checks for you anymore. And I definitely haven't been checked on from anybody from the business. These people who I was so close with and so tied in together with, I, you know, where did, where did everybody go? Nobody, nobody went. So I love the sense of community. I think we all love that. I think that's why people still go to church and get involved in certain things because that community aspect, being part of people who think the same way that you do. And un the interesting thing was this, was that this is before, this is before the economy shut down back in 2007, 2008, and before the church fired me, uh, 2007, out the blue, October 23rd, 2007, out the blue. And all the money that I put into that business is gone. They made their money, they stacked it, they probably got it invested somewhere, making residual income off of that. And um, I think that's why people kind of get involved in churches and, and get involved in a lot of these things so that they can, um, you know, feel connected and feel part of something, you know. But the problem that I find is like it's good, but it seems like, like I had a saying, there's no activity without a community. There's no activity without, a, there's no community without activity. If there's no activity or action involved, with the group of people, then the community is gone. There's no community without an activity. You got to have an activity that people are on. So for me, it was the business or getting into business and trying to retire before 30. And, or people going to church and we all want to worship God. But if, 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 if everybody wasn't so interested in worshiping God at church, being part of that community, then when or the activity of, of worshiping God or the activity of choosing to believe in God, there would be no community. And um, so I'm glad that, so I was just kind of wondering, where did everybody go? What happened to everybody? What's everybody's story? I can remember sitting in churches, watching these videos of boats and yachts. I was like, wow, I like to experience that because I never experienced that. And I only rode on a boat one time with some friends at high school and they weren't my black friends. They were my white friends at high school that had access to, who lived by a lake, who had access to a boat. So it's like, wow, okay. Well, you know, there's nothing against anybody. It's just, you kind of wonder why is it set up that way or why does it look that way and not another way? You know, why wasn't I <laughs> living, grew up and lived by a lake and why my dad, who supposedly was making really good money at GM, didn't, was never interested in buying boats. You know, these are the unanswered questions that probably will never be answered. So... Yeah, that's my experience with Quickstar, LTD, Amway. And I don't, you know, and, you know, I'm, but I can say this is that as far as getting passive income, I've learned how to do it other ways in my own business with designing sounds and samples and building a YouTube channel. And that has been the most realistic realization of any of that stuff that business talked about over 10 years ago. That has been the most real thing to me now. And it's not perfect. And I always believe I should have be making more off of that, off of my music. I was like, well, that's the original plan to live off of anyway. And I had to adapt it since then. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, I mean, so I know the language. I know, like, anybody who comes or talks about what they're doing to it, anybody who has a product, like, I know, I know what's going on because I live that life. I, I know. I know you didn't manufacture that product yourself. You got to upline in order, and then there's a cost to be a part of that. There's a cost to be a part of a group or a multi-level marketing or whatever you want to call it. And there's a cost. And then if there's a, there's a cost to it, you got to have products and then you have to bring people in or be part of community. Like I understand the whole dynamic. Not everybody. It's just, there's a lot of them. And a lot of them send themselves it's like, well, we're not like, well, we're not, I understand that, but you're still paying for something. You still have an upline. You still have a downline. You're still interested in getting people involved in the business. It's just a different name and a different time. And, you know, you have to ask yourself, all right, is this, is this, and, and that's, that was my experience. Like I had to buy products so i was buying from my, i was the business and customer i was buying products 
and I was buying educational materials from the leadership group, which lined their pockets up. And so I became a super consumer under the guise of being a producer. But I'm glad I learned from that. And I was just wondering, I just had experience about that. And I, I just wanted to talk about it. So on my blogging channel, this is where I blog. This is a video blog. So I, you know, I can't speak for anybody else's experience. That's what's mine. I'm just glad that what I'm involved in now does actually generate actual income from my work. And I don't have to dress up in suits going to hotels to get it. And I don't have to feel like I'm trying to belong to something that I'm not sure that people want me to be a part of. Yeah. All right. That's the daily vlog for this. All right.